Hello, this is Carl Ackerman, the host of History is Here to Help. And today I'm with two lovely people, Eric Gray and Lynn Broads, and they have been working together to produce two wonderful, what I would call social historical books about baseball that are very lively and very wonderful. You know, it's so lovely to be here with Eric Gray and Lynn Rhodes. Um, they have both, they've collaborated on writing and producing um, and being a business manager, as it were, um, in terms of the two wonderful books. And the first thing I'm going to ask, um, you know, uh, both Eric and Lynn, but perhaps Eric first, is tell us about, um, you know, basically your two books, and then uh, we'll go from there. Thanks, Carl. Um these two books are collections of stories from people all around the world about their experiences that in one way or another touch upon baseball. Um, while they are sometimes involve play of game kinds of things, uh, they're far more often um, human interest stories, uh, stories about family, stories about why they love baseball, um, stories about funny or sad things that happened at baseball games. It's that, um, it's let's just say the book went in a far different direction than the way I expected it to go. You know, um, I, you know, I should have precursed all this by saying that, you know, Eric and Lynn have had, you know, long careers uh, with the department of labor and been very successful in their careers. And this is a new career for both. And um, Eric and Lynn, both of you, uh, my question is, how did you come to this? Because, you know, it, it seems a bit different than your former life where you were, helping people in many different ways with the Department of Labor, but this is this was a, certainly a change. So um, uh, why did you get into this? What made you interested in this? And this is a question for both of you. I'll, I'll, lead, I'll lead off with this one, so to speak. Um, Lynn and I were at a ball game in 2011 uh, with our daughter uh, and our friend. And baseball being what it is, it gives you the opportunity to sit and think, just look out at the field, chat with your friends, you know, whatever, it's a, the, the pace of the game allows that. And I just happened to idly ask them, what was your favorite moment at a game? What was your favorite game or favorite moment at a game? Um, they gave me their answer and I just went and asked uh, a bunch more people about their favorite moments. And um, really that's how, that's how it began. I just began my quest asking people for their stories. And Lynn, I'm gonna I'm gonna follow up with you. Um, okay. So, um, you know, Eric began to do this, and so what was your role? And you know, how did you feel about this? And uh, did it ever interfere with you going out, <laughs> going to a Giants game? Because <laughs> Eric was home writing. So uh, I'll I'll stop there. And there. I think the thing that Eric spent the most time doing, and it was really eight years between when the when the quest started and the book, first book came together, is wherever we were, whether it was at a ball game or at an airport or at uh, the San Diego Zoo, Eric was talking to people that had some indication that they might be baseball fans. So I just had to kind of stand by and my role was mostly to just re gently remind him sometimes <laughs> that we had to be someplace. But mostly it was Eric collecting the stories over that long period, wherever we were. So at some point, I think we, we we decided together that it was time to stop asking for more stories and actually start working on putting it together as a book. So I think I think I had some role there encouraging Eric to finally start putting it all together and figuring out how we're gonna get it published. So that that's a that's a good segue into um both for Eric and Lynn, and I'll start with Eric. So what are the stories that you are especially fond of, and I'm sure you're fond of all these stories. And there's a you know a large collection in both your books. And um, if you had a, happen to have a copy of the books near you, and you could show them to us today, <laughs> um, uh, that would be great. But you know, what are the key stories? And of course, uh, because the name of the show is History is uh, Here to Help, launched by you know my good friend Jay Fidel. Um, uh, you know, what were the what were the stories that you think have um, a historical significance? And of course. You know, there's, there's, I mean, in, in some ways, the history of the United States is marked by baseball, and baseball marks the history of the United States. I mean, you think of Jackie Robinson as a clear example, but I'm going to stop now and let you guys talk about 
the wonderful story is in your two books. Thanks, Carl. Um, this is my first book. It's called Bases to Bleachers. And this is my second book. It's called Backyards to Ballparks. And for the record, Carl has a story in, in this second book. Um, you know, asking to, to choose what your favorite stories are is really quite complicated. In the course of collecting the stories, I've got by now almost 2,000 stories from over 15 countries. Um, when I think about the stories from a historical um, context, uh, and I want to be clear, I've never set out to write an academic scholarly book. That's not what this is. Um, but in, in collecting the stories, uh, some of them turned out to be kind of of historical significance. So, for example, um, everybody knows that the movie, everybody knows the movie The League of Their Own. Most people know that it is based on a, a real league. And in fact, I have a story from a woman who played in that league. Her name is Maybell Blair. And Lynn and I were lucky enough to actually meet her a couple of months ago in Phoenix. Uh, there's a story from a woman um, who, Japanese American woman, and she played baseball in the internment camps during World War II. And, um, you know, it's kind of crazy to think about it, but, you know, that was the, the motivation for doing this baseball thing is because they wanted to, quote unquote, normalize life in the concentration camps. As silly as that seems, the fact is, um, it's, a, it's a very interesting story. She played in that, um, in that league. Um, you know, there's a story from a guy whose grandfather was shot down in World War II and uh, captured by the Germans, and he's convinced that a little baseball glove chachi, like a key ring, ultimately saved his life. Um, you know, these stories are just in base. There's a chapter, an entire chapter in the first book on the Negro Leagues, um, which, um, you know, it's a variety of stories, one, one or two from actual uh, Negro League uh, veterans and others who just saw New Goalie games. I mean, it's a it's a variety of stuff. Like all the chapters, you know, are are kind of um, have a variety of stories that don't necessarily um, neatly fit into what the title is. Um, one of the things I really wanted to do, I was focusing on, is getting stories from people who watch baseball in the twenties or thirties or forties. And as we all know. You know, those people are not with us in, in great numbers anymore. So I came across the idea of getting, asking people to give me stories that maybe their parents or their grandparents told them. And it's in a chapter called Stories Handed Down. And there are some, a number actually of Jackie Robinson stories in the books, um, as well as stories like uh, somebody being at the game when, um, when Babe Ruth made his famous point, his call of a home run shot or or being at the game when Lou Gehrig uh, retired and he made his famous, today I'm the luckiest man on the face of the earth speech. So um, I'm actually getting goosebumps now when I think about that. So there are stories of significance. There are stories, uh, there's a couple of stories that, that really have to do with, with race, but you know how sometimes race can be um, bypassed just because of love of the game. So, let me ask a question to Lynn now also. So while Eric is writing these stories and um, what was your communication like about these stories? And I, I have to um, precurse this by saying that I was there when you were trying to name uh, the second book. And it was one of the most interesting, I, I was all ears. And I listened to you guys go back and forth about what the, what the book name should be and why it should be this. And, you know, I'm glad that you, you, you finally came to a conclusion, but what was it like having these uh, kind of wonderful discussions? Because it's really, a credit to both of you that um, being married, that you have these kind of wonderful discussions about um, uh, these two books. Well, I got to say, I probably heard almost every, you know, when just for the first book, Eric collected over 1,200 stories. Uh, so he had a decision, a lot of decisions to make when he put 250, 270 of them in the first book. Um, I probably heard almost all of the stories at one time or another when Eric received them, especially ones he was really excited about. Um, 
and definitely participated in helping him whittle whittle them down because there were some that were very similar. We talked about the stories. We decided which one was maybe the better story for whatever reason. It wasn't always the best written story. It might have been the one that had the most interesting uh interesting topic or the way it was put together. Uh, so I heard all the stories. I probably talked to Eric about most of them. And, you know, again, we talked a lot about how to put how to put them in the book. And I think I made a bunch of suggestions, some of which Eric took <laughs> in in putting the putting the book together and chaptering this chaptering the books. And yeah, the the titles of the books that was a that was a, a project for the village that went out that went out to many people uh, where we got we got input from a lot of people. Uh, and there were nuances too, right? There were there were nuances in the titles. I mean, you know, I think we both liked the alliteration of bases to bleachers. So, and a friend of mine suggested you know a collection of per personal baseball stories from the stands and beyond. I mean, bases to bleachers conveyed kind of a range of where stories would come from, right? And I liked the alliteration and wanted to do that again for the second book. Um, the fact that the second book also was a pair of bees, backyards of ballparks, I mean, that wasn't intentional. We we tried lots of things and, you know, for a variety of reasons, we just happened to have, you know, another pair of bees in the title. Yeah, well, we did some research on, you know, you don't, you don't want to use somebody else's title, you don't want to. I was I was the one that did a lot of the research to see what would work and what didn't work and what had already been put out in the world. Well, you know, as I recall, when I was in your living room, you were talking about bases to bleachers too, and playing <laughs> off that TWO and TOO. That was so, one of the so, possibilities. Yeah. And so I, you know, I'm glad that you came to a resolution on all this. So. <laughs> Before I go on and ask you, well, let me ask you the question. And, and um, uh, but let me ask you first is, so if you wanted to get these, one of these two wonderful books, is it possible to get them on Amazon? How do you get these books? Yeah, the, the books are available online, whether it's Amazon, barnesandnobles.com, you know, any independent, online. Yeah, independent. Independent bookstores, bookstores they will order the book. Um, but also I also on, want. I was going to say online, you can get them. There's, there's a number of, of, wonderful websites that uh, that participate in in uh, funding independent bookstores. So um, I'm trying to remember those. However you want to do it is yeah. fine. But I also want to say that um, anybody who wants, for what it's worth, anybody who wants a signed copy can get the book directly from me. So, you know, I don't know, Carl, if there's a, a mechanism for putting my email address or, or whatever. But or you can contact me through my website, which is basis to bleachers.com. So anybody who wants to get the book signed again for what that's worth, um, they can get the book directly from me. Also, and, a lot of the online sources are are identified on the website. So, you know, we have about um, 14 minutes left. So what I wanted to do now is just to you know, tell us some of the stories, because that's always the the you know sort of the the highlight of anything of any book you know to get sort of a a taste of these of these wonderful stories so eric i'll probably go to you on this one okay um it, there are so many stories and and they're they're you know so reflected even in in the chapter titles like there's a there's a, a chapter in the second book called to catch a ball or not because sometimes that not catching a ball is far more interesting than the story about catching the ball um, each book has a chapter on family. Um, in the first book, it's called Generation to Generation, uh, baseball, uh, family and baseball. In the second book, because I knew that that was so, such a, a core chapter of the first book that I knew that had to be in the second book as well. And it's called The Bats and Balls and Gloves That Bind. Um, one of the stories, and you know, I have a few stories in each book. Lynn has a story in each book. Um, but honestly, one of the stories that's most important to me is how this didn't even take place at a game. Lynn and I were watching the game on TV when Matt Cain threw his perfect game. And um, during the course of this exciting event, we started texting with our daughter, Rachel, who works the press elevator at the park. And then we wound up texting with David, our son, David, in D.C., um, who knew we should be going to bed, but 
how could he have gone to bed not only watching the Giants throw a perfect game, what was going to be a perfect game, only the 23rd in history, but this was our favorite player, Matt Cain. So, you know, the, the importance of the story is not the perfect game. It's how this game of baseball once again connected our family. This magical game has been a connection to our family that has continued now through the next generation. And if there's a third book, the story about how we took our two-year-old granddaughter to her first game, that's already written and will be in a book. It will be in, in, in the third book. Um, well, Eric, let me just, let me just yeah. interject there. It sounds like you have another book waiting to be written about family values in baseball. Okay, continue <laughs> on. Sorry to interrupt. Well, no, that's all right. You know, there. You know, again, there, each book has a chapter um, on on baseball and family because that was one of the most common stories about you know going with having a catch with grandma, or going to a you know to a game, the first game with dad. Um, you know, it, you know, it was just such an important part of so many of these stories. And another thing that I discovered in getting these stories, as I started to group them, and as we say in California, the chapters kind of happened organically <laughs> because the stories just f fell into a, a series of themes. And one of the chapters, again, it's in both books, different titles, is what baseball means to me because I came to quickly understand that baseball is a lot more than just, oh, I love this game to a lot of people, you know, people who really just feel like their lives were changed because of baseball. Um, and, uh, you know, that, that to me was, I guess, surprising. I just hadn't really, you know, thought of it in those terms. Um, you know, I mean, Carl, I could sit and tell you a million stories. I could tell you the story about my friend who was in a bar and having a drink with someone and didn't know it was Ernie Banks. Um, and when her friend told her it was Ernie Banks, you know, you know, she went back and got his autograph and said, wow, you must have been a great basketball player. Everybody thinks so highly of you. <laughs> you know, I mean, it, it's it's so hard for me to, to, you know, to think about which of these incredible stories is a story in the first book about a guy in, in Texas. His name is Frank, who, as COVID was kind of beginning its descent. Winding down. <laughs> winding down his wife just kind of set up having a catch with people in the neighborhood and people showed up and there was a reporter there and and it's it was basically you know what a wonderful story to kind of celebrate the semi return to life as we knew it you know um and you you know, you've written about, um, you know, you talked about a league of their own, uh, which is, uh, it, correct me if I'm wrong about women playing baseball, especially during World War II when the men mm -hmm. were off fighting. Um, but you've also written stories about, um, as you mentioned, about the Negro Leagues, right. when African Americans were pro prohibited um, from, you know, uh, playing um, in the major leagues as we knew it, um, uh, because of the many laws that segregated in the United States. But what I wanted to ask you, but you're very inclusive. You even included um, or um, talked to the person from the uh, Negro Museum here where I am today in Kansas City, Missouri. And so, uh, you know, tell us about how you um, got these stories, but more almost as importantly about, you know, um, those stories that you found particularly near and dear because of the history, you know, of, of your of father's or grandfather's generation. Yeah. Well, let me start with that Negro League's. Uh, well, it wasn't an Eagle League story, but let me start with the story you're referring to. So uh, a guy gave me, a, for a story to be, as people will say, bookworthy, and I never use that term, but other people did. Oh, my book, my story isn't bookworthy. Um, it's got to be more than just, you know, I, I saw Hank Aaron's 715th home run. And for those of you who don't know what that is, that was the home run that beat Babe Ruth's all-time home run record. So, you know, if you tell me I was at the game when he hit that home run, but that's all you tell me, well, you know, good for you is a great memory, but it's not, you know, there's nothing book worthy about it. Through a connection, I got a story from a man who talked about watching the game. He was a 12 year old boy in Georgia, and he talked about watching the game on television. And he goes on to talk about the fact that some people think records are meant to be broken, other people are you know, think that records are not meant to be broken. 
especially by a black man. And he said, in this house, there was no question about wanting this record to be broken. And as Hank Aaron hit the home run and ran the bases, Bob ran the bases with him. He ran from his easy chair to the bookshelf, to the television, to the chair, or whatever it was, the sofa, and back to his chair. And that is just a remarkable story. And of course, this man turned out to be uh, the president of the Negro Leagues Museum, Bob Kendrick, who spent 30 minutes with me and Lynn when we were when we were visiting there. And it's just it's just a remarkable story, and the story continu continues on to, to you know when he um, when he met Hank Aaron at a at a game when they were honoring him, and how he had Gates ribs with Hank and his wife Billy, and how it's something he'll never forget. Um, there's a story from my uncle, and there was never going to be a, a chapter in the book about watching on TV or listening on the radio, and I because I got a couple of them, and it just wasn't. You know, it just was something I wasn't going to entertain. My original thought was, you were at a game. And my uncle's story was about how he and my dad and their other brother were crowded around a radio in 1934 in their kitchen as they were listening to the second ever All-Star game. And uh, Carl Hubble, who is a Hall of Famer, struck out five American leaguers in a row. And my uncle said i knew it was a great thing but i didn't realize how important it was and he juxtaposed it with watching jacob de and his all-star debut strike out three batters in a row and he said that was great but it made me realize how unbelievably important and memorable that game was 80 years ago or you know whatever it was and you know those are the stories that just kind of they they just make me smile and and they still give me the chills when i when i read them do you think um, that um, this is both for you and Lynn, um, that your attraction to baseball came because you were New York, you, 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 you know, you had teams in New York, Eric, and of course, Lynn comes from one of the great uh, baseball cities in Chicago. I mean, what is it that made you two um, particularly attracted to, um, towards uh, baseball? Um, you know, because I think that's sort of the nucleus before you can write a book like this. Um, and um, in addition to that, I have to say about both of you, it's always nice to see you. You know, I've gone to games with you uh, at Candlestick, for example, before Oracle was built. And, um, and you know, you have a whole, I mean, you know, Lynn dresses up and she wears <laughs> earrings, you know, that are uh, SF Giants. And, and, and you know, of course, all both you and your children are dressed in, you know, attractive San Francisco paraphernalia. Um, but what made you guys really geared towards um, baseball? And was it your origins in these two wonderful cities of New York and Chicago? Lynn, you could feel this one first. Well, okay. I, you know, I, I never went to a ball game in Chicago, but I used to watch the games on TV <laughs> with my dad, uh, mostly on the weekends because he worked six days a week. And at that time, the Cubs only played day games because there were no lights at Wrigley Field. So he, I, we watched a lot of Cubs games on, on TV. I lived on the South side, so I thought I was a White Sox fan, but I probably knew more about the Cubs because that's what I watched with my dad on TV. Um, but I've kind of lost interest as I was getting older when we came to San Francisco and our kids, we took our kids, started taking our kids to the game. And if you want to go from there, Eric. Yeah, I mean, I grew up a Yankees fan because that's all there was at the time. And when you have Mickey Mantle running around center field and hitting home runs, what more could you possibly need? <laughs> I became a Mets fan. I went to Mickey Mantle's retirement game. That's that's a story. It's in the book. Um, and then when I moved out here to San Francisco, I would go to games, you know, a couple of times a year when the Mets were playing the Giants and Lynn would come occasionally. But I'll tell you how Lynn got involved with baseball. It's... Um, in the introduction to my first book, I talk about taking my kids to their first game and how Rachel brought about 200,000 books with her because she knew how bored she would be. And uh, she never read a word. The only thing she read was the scoreboard, scorecard I bought and the scoreboard and how at the age of 14, she started working for the Giants. And um, there is no doubt in my mind that Rachel's love of baseball is what got Lynn involved. You know, it's different now even than it was, you know, 20, 25 years ago. But when your son likes baseball, that's like, duh. Well, of course he does. When your daughter likes baseball, 
that's a whole different level. And that's when Lynn started getting involved because then we, we bought a, you know, a, a season a, a ticket, a, a season pack, season ticket package uh, that we went to 15 games a year or whatever it was. And, and that's where Lynn's love of baseball emerged. It's, it was really because of Rachel's love of baseball. And that's, that's a good segue into the last. We only have a couple minutes left, but I want to let you guys finish by talking about, so what does uh, Rachel do now? And, um, and uh, has she had any interesting experiences at um, Oracle Park? Well, yeah, I mean, she still runs, she runs a press elevator. So everybody in the park knows her. Um, the announcers, the former players, anybody who uses the elevator. She has a story in each book um, about people she's met in the elevators. And one story involves Orlando Cepeda and the other story involves Jeff Kent. And they're really great stories. Her story in the second book is in the chapter, Ushers and Vendors and Ball Boys, Oh My. Um, David still loves baseball, um, but at least until COVID. Uh, I went every year to take him to see the, the Giants generally lose to the Nationals, but uh, he and his wife and his daughter are Giants fans. And uh, as I said before, taking Juliet to her first game was spectacular. Yeah, so, we, we make sure they're outfitted in Giants gear, Carl. We that's correct, right. <laughs> okay, that'll do it. Yeah. So we have only a minute left, but here's what I want to ask you. And if you could make your answer short, because I want to leave you the last word. What's next, Eric? What's next, Lynn? Well, for me, um, as I said, there might be a third baseball book, but um, my next project is a is one of, of a similar nature. It's about people's um, concert and music memories because um, because music is just so important to me, and it's been a major factor in in my life. With twenty seconds left, Lynn. Well, you know, I, I assume my role in in relation to the books is is going to be the same with that book as with this, which is listening to the stories, helping helping Eric uh, figure out which ones are are. The great ones, because sometimes he doesn't realize it until you get some feedback. Um, and I do all the, I, I keep all the books and I make all the the other stuff happen. So just keep on. Lynn, Lynn's him. role, Lynn's role in this is far greater than I can explain to you in a short period of time. I mean, she didn't collect the stories, but man, her involvement in so many facets of these books is is huge. Thank you, Eric Gray, Lynn Rhodes. This is History is Here to Help, and your host, Carl Ackerman. Thank you very much for a wonderful discussion, and everyone should go out and buy these books. <laughs> Not only if you love baseball, but if you love family and you love life, these are the books to buy. Thanks, Carl. Thank you, Carl, for having us. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.